So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for today's talk on the pests and diseases of Irish hedgerows. I'm Katie Smirnova, and I'm from the Campaigns Officer with Hedgerows Ireland, which is an organisation working to conserve hedgerows around the island and promote best practice for nature-friendly management. And as part of this, we're raising awareness around the importance of sourcing Irish provenance trees and you know, ways of mitigating the, the risks of pests and disease on our hedgerows to maintain this wonderful habitat into the long term as, you know, you know at its full health. And today we're delighted to have Maria Cullen here. So Maria Cullen is a mycologist, one of Ireland's leading mycologists, and is here today to talk to us about the main kind of issues um, facing Ireland's hedgerows in regards to pests and diseases. And Maria is a director with Woodlands of Ireland and the Organic Centre and was previously the chairperson of the Irish Plant Pathologist Society. So thank you so much, Maria. And we're delighted to have your expertise with the natural sciences and your master's in mycology as well here today. So I'll hand over to you and we'll leave the questions until afterwards, folks. Thanks a million. Thank you very much, Katie. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfectly. That's great. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, today, it's a wonderful holiday uh, coming up for our female saint of Ireland and um, the first day of spring traditionally in Ireland. So it's a lovely evening to be uh, talking. I'm sorry about the darkness of the topic and uh, I'll try and keep it uh, as general and as light as possible. But I know that specifically we'll have plenty to talk about at the end. And I think with Katie, we've agreed to use the talk as a kind of a springboard for some discussion at the end. So I'll leave some time for that. OK, Katie, could we have the next slide, please? Great, I'll do that myself. Uh, Cage of Fields uh, was one of the first hedgerows known in the world, I think, and uh, a very early farm landscape from about 6,000 years ago. Uh, Ireland has a huge heritage, obviously, in hedgerows and walls. Rats uh, were a very round feature and a very notable uh, feature of the Irish landscape. And we see some remnant rats in the Burren, uh, but also all around the country. Uh, Black Pig's Dyke stands out from Northwest Ireland as a major division line between Connacht and Ulster. And from the uh, just before the 12th century onwards, at the arrival of the Normans, there were Irish townlands starting to develop. Uh, we had the Pale, which became famous all around the world in, in our language. But uh, from the 14th century, it was called the Pale, based on wooden stakes or pales and Latin palace as the name. So uh, the Pale was denoting parts of Dun Dublin, Louth, Meath and Kildare from the rest of Ireland. Uh, after that, then uh, we had the post down survey experience in the plantations from the 1600s. And uh, obviously our hedgerows and walls were used to delimit land ownership. And from there we had the Townlands Acts. So from 1826, uh, onwards we had very important hedgerows today are based on townland boundaries from that time and before. Uh, if we move on to the next slide please. Okay so uh, my definition is a very loose one probably for an Irish hedgerow and I understand I'm talking to hedge layers among others and I apologise for my version of Irish hedgerows but for me a hedgerow is a raised linear rounded feature or a bit of both um, and outlines fields uh, for a lots of different purposes um, in the past to defend territory to note ownership and to provide shelter and to keep animals in. Obviously, stock proofing was a big part. So hedgerows can be made of trees and shrubs uh, with walls. 
in the centre of them or uh, and trees beside or on top of them. And then in my local area, we have a lot of soil banks in the centre with cobblestones of small granite stones and lower Paleozoic stones um, as an outer layer with trees on top. So a hedge to me is uh, something in a garden and uh, whether it's made of ornamental or native shrubberies, um, I have a particular hatred of the uh, laurel hedge, uh, even though it's so popular today. So uh, if we move on, sorry, thank you. Uh, and this is my, an ideal hedge in my mind, I suppose. Uh, this is in lovely North Leitrim and uh, is a beautiful example of a hedgerow. It mightn't be for some of the people uh, locally here who like uh, taking trucks down through a small lane, but that's my my lovely uh, hedgerow idea in my head. So uh, next slide, please. We have uh, this throughout our Irish landscape. This is a photo from Aintree. Grand National, and uh, I'm afraid that in the southeast of Ireland and across good land, I suppose, in, in Ireland, we have a tendency nowadays to have hedgerows that look a bit like the jumps in Aintree to me. Sorry, uh, Katie, next slide, please. OK, so uh, what's not a hedgerow? I suppose, and this is where I differ with people about uh, the short top and sides. Um, I know A-frame hedges are uh, more the thing and what Chagas are aiming for now. But uh, unfortunately, in a lot of places, contractors, subcontractors, landowners like a flat top hedge, like they're in a garden. And um, this other on the right hand side is a hedgerow that was grubbed out in County Kerry. And even though uh, people came to visit it from different um, organisations uh, in Irish government circles, uh, nothing was done about the grubbing out of a, about a kilometre of hedgerow. So we have various issues uh, about that, but we'll come to that. So the next slide, please, Katie. Uh, hedgerows around the world. Uh, there's some wonderful researchers in France uh, uh, from around Rennes. Uh, we have uh, Jean Baudry and um, various people in France who love their bocage landscapes and have taken it abroad, as have we, to places like Canada in the top right picture there. In uh, the middle, we have um, a photo from the Andes in Ecuador. We don't really think about hedgerows in South America much, at least I hadn't. And uh, then in the bottom right hand corner, France, uh, Brittany, and then our own lovely hedgerows in Ireland. Next slide, please. So we've just listed, oops, we might need to, not sure what's happened there. We should have a list of three columns. Um, main native trees of Ireland. Oh, I'm terribly sorry that got lost in translation. Uh, I'll just run quickly down because it's basically almost all of our native trees. We have ash, hawthorn, blackthorn, holly, apple, spindle, elder, hazel, alder, willow of various species, sessile oak, pedunculate oak, Gelder Rose, Rowan, Birch, Wild Cherry, Bird Cherry, Scots Pine, Aspen sometimes, Elms was making a comeback for a while, uh, White Beam, Yew, Pedunculate Oak I mentioned. So these species all have their own host pathogens, their own host fungi, their own host bugs and uh, as well as a range of associated pleasant species to us and to them. So I, I guess when we're thinking about each individual tree type, we're not uh, thinking of a, an individual. In my mind, we're thinking of a huge community of species on and in and under and around. So uh, when we value a hedgerow, we value all of that ancillary stuff as well. All life. Next slide. You have it already. Sorry. Um, so generally, the woody plants are things like gorse, bramble, 
wild raspberry if we're lucky, the roses and mm, I've included bull eggs, golden bull eggs or damson was considered by some to be a native bush or a uh, small tree. Next slide, please, Katie. OK, so we have forbs and other types of plants, softer plants, uh, Robin Run the Hedge, the Cleavers, Herb Robert, uh, all of the umbellifers, the various things like nettle and, you know, all of the things that make up the ground flora of a hedgerow as well. And they all come with their own pathogens. And whether I'm counting things as pathogens or pests, I guess uh, we're looking at pests and diseases which are pathogenic in the main. There are things that break down the rotten uh, parts of trees and plants and leaves and they're essential for recycling the nutrients of uh, the hedgerow but for this talk I'm really talking about pathogens more so in the dangerous things that we com come across on all of these types of plants and trees. Next slide please. Okay so another uh, layer of a hedgerow would be ivy, honeysuckle and traveller's joy is the main lianes. Uh, these are the climbers that can choke a hedge or run along a hedge and climb the trees of a hedgerow. Uh, also then the roses and the brambles take part to an extent in the lower reaches of the hedgerow. Um, I'm probably a little bit strange for some uh, conservationists in disliking ivy significantly um that's I, i'm up for debate about it but for me ivy can in places cover a huge number of epiphytic lichens mosses and liverworts on uh, trees uh, in hedgerows or elsewhere and for that reason there's enough ivy around and if we cut it back where it shouldn't be and that is up for debate as to where it shouldn't be as well um but leaving enough room for all of the other species too next slide please katie okay cryptogams include the spore producing plants um which include the fungi the lichenized and non-lichenized fungi and the mosses, liverworts, algae, ferns, horsetails, that would be the equisetums, and the fern allies. So uh, when we think about uh, some beneficial fungi on hedgerows, we can look at the biodiversity of these lichens uh, in particular, but also the other fungi like Flamulina vilutopes, you'll see this time of the year, it's growing on stumps of trees and it's brightly coloured orange cap with a velvety dark to black and stem. Uh, so some of these things can be quite good or have their role as saprophytes breaking down uh, the lignum and the, the uh, falling leaves and seeds at this time of year. Okay, next slide, please. I think it's a bit slow. Uh, so we have naturalized trees and plants of our hedgerows besides our native ones. And these are a beautiful range of different things. So I used to be much more purist than I am now. And I'm afraid we're getting to the point with our trees in particular that any healthy, happy tree is OK with me. Um, in our hedgerows, we often have beech and sycamore, but we have other kinds of acers as well in the maples. We have horse chestnut, which is unfortunately becoming rare and dying out from a range of things that are occupying the horse chestnut and attacking it. Um, poplar occasionally, lovely addition of lilac. Uh, also syringa are in trouble as regards some pathogens taking them out. And then of course, especially in the southwest and west, we have fuchsia, um, mombrisha, crocosmia, uh, broom and catoniaster. And these can be significant um, hosts for 
Catoni uh, Aster, say, for example, in the west of Ireland can be a host for uh, things like Loberia pulmonaria, uh, the, the lung, tree lung wort lichen. So uh, they have their place. I'm focusing on the positives at the moment. So now I'm coming to common fungi of hedgerow trees in the next slide, where we have Philinus palmaceus, as uh, photographed here. And then there's uh, Trimetes versicolor, turkey tails on oak and others, uh, Polyporus guamosus, which is making a huge rise in biomass around the country as ash is declining, dryad saddle on ash is doing well. Then we have little things that are tongues on alder cones, but they make the alder cones redundant and non-performing. Uh, Tephrina alni there. We also have other Tephrinas. We have Xylaria, which breaks down little bits of sticks and timber of holly, ash and whitethorn. Tremella mesenterica, you'll see this yellow goo on gorse and ash at the moment. Uh, things like Venturia on crabapple, Botrytis cinerea on the fruits as well of blackberry and Phragmidium violaceum. Um, lovely small orange, uh, rusty looking material uh, on blackberry leaves. OK, next slide, please. So uh, then we come to the sad part of the talk where we're looking at a third of our native tree species being killed off by a range of things, a lot of them down to our activities. So here we're looking at general things, uh, agricultural practices, and that can be policy and direction that isn't just down to uh, farmers deciding to take out trees, um, but instructed to do so, and then other developments. So there's a lot of human activity here in the mix, uh, but the pathogens themselves are taking out quite a lot of our global tree material, up to a third our, uh, of species uh, being attacked and killed by uh, global pathogens of trees um, currently. So we're, um, sorry, next slide, please. We're going through uh, what some people consider to be a mass extinction. And a lot of that has to do with us being a major pathogen of trees and hedgerow plants as well. Um, since my in my lifetime, since I was born, the number of people on the planet has doubled and that each person would like to have a good quality of life. So uh, this is the problem. We are not only double the population in a very short time, but we are demanding more and more of our planet in terms of uh, cushioning from uh, the cold and from the elements, from hunger, from disease. And this is putting a huge pressure on natural resources of the planet. Next slide, please. So uh, this is not meant to be read, sadly, it is a very big, long list. And a lot of it has to do with forest and economic trees. So this is a, uh, uh, if you want to read it, there's a report out in the last couple of days from the uh, Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine of the surveys that have been going on um, of trees, pathogens, uh, around the country last year. So that's just a list of the species looked for and gladly uh, not found in some cases, thank goodness. But we'll look into some of these in more detail now. Katie, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, one of the things that we've been concerned about recently is Erwinia amelivora fire blight. And this is what it looks like in different guises. So it can look on the right uh, like a very strange uh, goo that is pretty clear to whitish on the surface of fruits. And it attacks apples and plums and um, a whole range of our food uh, fruits from trees. But also it looks in the leaves as if the 
tree is dead, when a plant is dead, that it affects. And also it can produce cankers on the bark as well. So these uh, fire blight is not, and, and many of these diseases and pests that I'll have a look at, diseases in particular are nearly impossible to kill. They are not easy to control and prevention is the best form of management. Um, where you have fire blight in Ireland, there have been some incursions into Ireland, although we've kept our, uh, our fire blight free zone for the moment uh, in almost everywhere, except in Northern Ireland and in Galway. Uh, but fire blight material, when it's harvested, uh, has to be incinerated or buried. It's very contagious. And so this is an issue over and over again for dealing with these uh, pathogens is what do we do with the material? Because uh, that can be very costly and um, quite uh, emotive, very emotional for the people managing the material and having to cut trees and take out plants and um, destroy them. So uh, next slide, please. We'll have a come back to some of that. Uh, we have Xylella fastidiosa as a major threat. It's not in Ireland currently, but it has arrived on numerous occasions. They've done some great genetic work and found that there are three subspecies. Two have come from North America, one from South America into Italy and uh, has spread. And in the bottom right, uh, you can see olive groves uh, in Italy that have been affected like this, where the trees have been felled sometimes or burnt in situ. And uh, this is what Xylella looks like. It's a bacterium. It's a small rod bacterium and it causes uh, the, the leaves to go yellow and orange and die. But Xylella is a called the plant plague of Europe. It has over 600 host species that it likes and it likes things like willow and ulex. And I know a lot of people would not be unhappy about gorse being destroyed by xylella, but uh, there are many, many other hosts and gorse itself is useful for lots of uh, species that interact with it and feed from it. So um, yeah, a huge concern in our time. Next slide, please. Okay, so fungal threats to our hedgerows. I'm just gonna bring that up here. We have a big list um, and it's, it's many, many species more than what I have here. Uh, our malaria melia. So we have honey fungus in Ireland for a long time. There are different species and some of them are much more aggressive than others. We have Piptoporus betulinus, um, which attacks spurch and kills off a certain number. It's got a big white uh, body to the fungus as a bracket that sticks out from the birch tree. Uh, Neonectra detissima is a not quite a coral spot, but it is uh, like um, like that. It's uh, Nectria galagina is the old name that people might know it by, and it affects things like birch, willow, apple, beech, and uh, the sycamores as well. Tafrina pruni is a pocket plum and affects that family. Claviceps purpurea is very frequent now on wild grasses and has a wide range of grasses that it occupies. Um, it's funny when you start seeing something, maybe it was always there, but in the last 20 years, I do believe that it's uh, getting more common. And Claviceps purpurea ergot is a source of major mycotoxin so that it causes uh, great damage to wildlife that eat it potentially, but also to humans. And we're legislating for those toxins in our food chain now. Uh, Ophistoma, of course, Dutch elm disease was the major warning shot. Uh, and if we didn't pay attention, then I think we're looking at a, a raft of diseases and pests that have come on the back of it. It has um, 
gets about by a vector, uh, an insect vector. And so um, both of the species of Ophiostoma are still working to destroy elm in Ireland. And so elm makes a bit of a comeback in hedgerows and then is killed off again. Um, another recent arrival is Phytophthora remorum, sudden oak death. It's a new mycete, so it's a water mold and it affects oak, but it affects larch and other species as well and moves along using uh, it piggybacks on uh, rhododendron in order to get about. So it's very prevalent across Ireland. Again, you can't put the genie back in the bottle once it's here. It's a matter of controlling and managing and what can we do about it? And of course, we're all familiar for the last 10 years, really, with Hymenocyphus fraxinius ash dieback or Chilara, as it was called from its anamorph. And that's the problem with some of these um, material is that they have two names, uh, an immature and a mature name. So Hymenocyphus fraxinius is the mature uh, material. Next slide, please. So uh, when I go internationally and talk to mycologists um, in different parts of the world, um, their knowledge of Ireland might be slim say for example Japan so you introduce yourself in Japan to my colleges and you say uh, you're from Ireland and they say ah Phytophthora infestans and it's very strange in Ireland that not too many people know the name of potato blight and um, its Latin name um, it's a new mycete and unfortunately Phytophthoras are a major major uh, threat to us uh, we're in a warm moist climate and phytophthoras do really well. Uh, you can imagine molds in general, but there is a, an interesting paper on how the world is getting moldy and phytophthoras are really winning. Also, climate change comes into this for us in Ireland because with less severe winters from frost and snow, we have uh, less ability, I suppose, to kill off these um, umai seeds and other fungi other pests as well in the winter time and that means that they're just getting through each winter and rising in numbers and i guess from covid we all realize about our numbers and a lot of epidemiology to do with infections and how uh, dose is very important so next slide please Okay, so ash dieback, just going into a little bit more, Hymenocyphus fraxinius. Uh, this is a recent publication of where it's got to from 2013 on to 2022. And we can see hot spots around the country, but also areas where it hasn't uh, arrived until recently. So a lot of counties are still um, just beginning to get into this crisis. I'll keep going, Katie. I'm sorry. Um, another major threat that I think is understated is the mountain ash virus. Uh, it, it looks a bit like this, this mottling of the leaves. And uh, we've noticed in hedgerow surveys that ash, uh, mountain ash or rowan is doing really poorly. And this may be why. So um, viral threats are hard to find, identify, and very hard to control. Next slide, please. And then we move on now. This is where I get a bit ropey. So apologies to any entomologists among us. Insect threats to our hedgerow plants. Uh, we have obviously the biggest threat that hasn't arrived yet is the emerald ash borer. It's a North American species and it is uh, on its way here. Um, even things like war in Ukraine, we have to try and keep this out and it's just not looking great, is it? Um, so I'll keep going. Uh, 
the bronze birch borer similarly uh, affects birch instead. And then oak processionary, we've had a few incursions into Ireland where people have spotted them and had them removed and trees have been destroyed. Um, ash sawfly is another one that can build up on ash. There's several things attacking ash. Drosophila suzukii, um, Michael Gaffney in Chagask is working on it. It moves along hedgerows. It's a new Asian fruit fly. And then we have the beetles and the aphids, and they can also, some of them be vectors for fungal or bacterial infections as well. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, invasives, we have, uh, this is the kind of language is the problem sometimes um, invasives uh, or pathogens or who's responsible as well goes with that. So some things fall within the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Other things are National Parks and Wildlife Service or uh, NBDC in Waterford. Uh, they have some nice uh, products in Waterford in NBDC. Uh, there's one on oak processionary moths as a resource. Next slide, please. Uh, so what are we doing to protect our hedgerows? Well, we're using legislation and a lot's been happening in that space. Uh, you go to the guards and hopefully the judiciary kicks in on prosecutions, although there have been very few over the years, really. And the fines have been small in comparison to other countries. Uh, we have inspectors and observers on the ground um, Quilta have people on the ground. Uh, there are about 120 people through the ports and airports uh, looking on a 24 hour cycle. So everybody uh, working there is on a rota and researchers, uh, taxonomists. I'm just having a wee bit of a problem with the slide. Just one second. I can go to that. And uh, obviously there are researchers uh, all over the place and taxonomists, geneticists and citizen sciences, scientists with amateur recorders. Um, there are probably professionally, though, about 200 people or less, uh, mainly looking at plant pathology issues in Ireland. It's a tiny number of people for the amount of pathogens we are now bringing in through global trade or threatening our shores. And this is a massive problem looking uh, ahead. So uh, we need more and more people, hopefully, in the sector looking at a one health scenario where we have plant and uh, animal and human as animals as well, uh, health as and with the environment all being dealt with on a par, which is a great aspiration for us. But um, how realistic it is, it requires a lot of people to make that happen and to agree to it. Um, but that is needed. Uh, we just haven't the people, the pairs of eyes out there trained to to find these things. Next slide, please. OK, so incentives um, that people have been availing of recently to help with hedgerows and, and trees in general, the native woodland scheme I'm involved with through Woodlands of Ireland, but Acres is a, another newer initiative to get people out there and planting whitethorn or hawthorn uh, in particular for hedgerow uh, revitalization or planting afresh. So uh, there are good aspects to the schemes and policy but the problem is if everybody does the same thing um and if that thing has negative consequences nobody thought of beforehand and uh, unintended consequences come with everything humans do but uh, if we are not proving them and managing the unintended consequences as well we end up with a, a much bigger problem potentially next slide please So hedge laying courses are things we can do to make things better. Uh, hedge laying is quite invasive uh, in the beginning. It's quite drastic as a, to see it, but it does keep the epiphytes, although when they bend the, the trees for making the hedgerow, uh, there is a change in water and light. 
to the um, stem of the tree that is bent over, but it's not broken completely and the tree grows back and the material, epiphytic material is there to benefit from that regrowth. You're not doing a slash and burn or extracting material. And the idea would be if you're uh, going to take out a hedge to put in your new hedge before you take out a hedge, um, and use material from the old hedge, if at all possible. I know that sounds very aspirational, but it's pretty much what we need to be doing. Next slide, please. Uh, we can also slow down. So with this slow food movement, uh, the people have been learning about the importance of food and how valuable it is and how valuable good food is in terms of fruit and vegetables that they can grow themselves. GIY have been doing things. So uh, courses on how to use a scythe to mow your hedgerow and to keep back from traffic in the summertime or year round, rather than using huge heavy plant machinery where you go along and flail a hedge or uh, mow a huge area um, and cut it back very drastically. Every time you cut a hedge, every time you cut a tree, it will cause a place where damage happens and where the tree may not recover and where infection and um, disease and pests can get in. Next slide, please, Katie. In Ireland, we were very good at protective legislation for hedgerows and in Brehan law there were trees and shrubs protected because of their importance to everyone. Um, penalties were, were imposed and they were hefty penalties for breaking, cutting and uh, damaging the bark or cutting the base of trees and hedgerow trees in particular. So our current laws, well a lot of it boils down to section 40 of the Wildlife Act. Um, and uh, supplementary material after that. Um, and I wonder is some of the unintended consequence of now imposing and really imposing the limit between the 1st of March and the 31st of August um, driving a great hedgerow damage and removal episode for the rest of the time. It does seem in some areas that all hell breaks loose and uh, that's that's pretty bad if there's a feeling of holding back until the autumn and the winter to do uh, a huge amount more uh, cutting than would have happened otherwise. So uh, next slide, please, Katie. Uh, here's uh, this is a Welsh example, actually, of someone who would got fined a huge amount of money, relatively speaking, £112,000 for cutting down beech trees uh, in a hedgerow. Very dramatic and really awful, but we've seen very disastrous uh, fellings going on um, all around us and internationally in, and really how to work with people uh, because fines are only one element and they don't really work really. Um, I think if people loved the trees, uh, this seemed to be an act of vengeance you kind of wonder what's going through somebody's mind to take out trees like that. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to uh, say that we do have protected zone status and that is a legal construct as well as uh, European legislation provides for us to declare ourselves free of particular pathogens and harmful organisms. And um, so a lot of the focus can be on commercial trees and plants, uh, forestry and uh, food plants. But uh, there are some some generalists there and some uh, protections for hedgerow trees and plants as well. Uh, next slide, please. Brexit has brought on a slew of uh, difficulties, I suppose, for plant health across now that the uh, Britain is diverging from Europe in its plant health strategy, and that will increasingly cause strain. Um, 
just in the last couple of days, safeguarding the union, uh, the literature has included on page nine, a range of native tree species prioritized by industry will be able to move again, including hawthorn and apple, uh, with more species being added to that. Um, and then uh, the plant passport scheme in the UK will be different from the European one. This poses uh, and the other items in the Safeguarding the Union document um, pose great threats potentially to uh, the health of our Irish hedgerows. Next slide, please. And it's not just um, our trees and seedlings, but also seed material can carry diseases and pests even. Uh, so this interesting work by Eva Franic on seeds being imported and moving around Europe and internationally further afield. Uh, she found um, insects, uh, larvae and fungi and uh, bacteria in seeds being transported. And I think I would always have gone with Leho Tedrasu, who's an Estonian geneticist and bioinformaticist. Uh, Leho uh, has done some work and really everything carries um, lots of things with it. That's not even to get onto plant media that things are carried around in. Even bare root material has some soil attached or media attached. So uh, with genetics, um, in next gen sequencing methodologies, we can look at uh, just how much material is being brought around and piggybacking on all of the plants and seeds that we move and cuttings as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so good management with regard to hedgerows in Ireland. Uh, every wound and cut is a potential site for infection. To follow best practice and prune if necessary. Um, sterilizing everything, washing, clothes, material, yourself. Uh, I always think of a joke by um, a master brewer I know, and he said that uh, brewing is something he do, does when he's not sterilizing things. Uh, that's very much what should be our attitude to hedgerow management uh, in Ireland and tree management more widely. Um, checking the soundness of roadside trees, health and safety is important. And um, I'll come to that again, uh, examining the plants regularly for diseases and pests and signs of damage, uh, not spraying headlands, not spreading slurry on headlands or trees or hedgerows and learning more and more. None of us know very much and we all can learn about the different pathogens that are threatening and coming to threaten our beautiful Irish native plants and trees. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so every time there's an accidental fall or a bough falls in some contexts, uh, it can lead to mass felling of trees that are sound in the area around or in the uh, location um, where concern spreads around an area. So if there's a car crash, somebody killed, there can be massive death of trees in the area too as a result. Next slide, please, Katie. Uh, even the dark hedges and you sometimes find this where trees have been removed you get instability especially on soft ground conditions and more loss happen to the dark hedges during storm isha next slide please uh, so what we can do don't import anything i know that sounds drastic but it is um if you can use your own seed material and cuttings from your local area or from your own uh, direct material, please do so. Uh, what has grown naturally in an area is genetically best suited to the soil conditions, the bedrock geology and the uh, climatic conditions of the area. Uh, become self-sufficient uh, because it's not just hedgerow material that is uh, bringing in dangerous pathogens into the country. Um, 
I know I can sound like Eamon de Valera and dancing at the crossroads, but uh, we do we're not self-sufficient as a country in fruit and vegetables and in um, grain. And so uh, this is something that we should be embarrassed about and be able to do for ourselves. Uh, wood packaging, uh, dunnage is a massive way to transfer uh, pathogens into the country. And uh, yes, have an eye out. If you have a plant health issue, don't ignore it. Photograph it. Uh, photograph the context it's in, sample it with gloves, put it in a paper bag. Uh, genetics won't work if it's in a plastic bag. Seal it, place it in a plastic container or bag, seal that carefully, and then contact a plant pathologist on what to do next. Sending photos to someone is a really good way to start the ball rolling for proper uh, follow up. Um, next slide, please, Katie. Highlighting the benefits of healthy hedgerows uh, and the huge benefits that there are across the board. I love this slide. I think it's a beautiful diagram of just some of the multitude of uh, things a really good hedgerow can do. And going blackberrying with people uh, of different generations can really be something to look back on in time to come as something wonderful uh, that lovely day we went blackberry picking. I think that emotive side is if our hearts don't love something, our heads can't. Um, next slide, please, Casey. And the last slide, thankfully. Uh, campaigning. I think they do this much more in England. There's a threat from various large uh, uh, projects over there and this uh, on the right the Darwin oak that was um, hundreds of people showed up to try to protect it and it doesn't always work but it does draw attention and the, in urban areas too uh, yellow ribbons are used regularly and communities get together to save trees that are important to them. Uh, so I know it's kind of a broader brush than strictly hedgerows and uh, sorry for going over time but Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really, really fascinating. Um, for the q and I might just go back to the slides you had in regards to what we can do. Um, and then people can just kind of have that there in mind for the questions. So they are great. And that diagram, this diagram here, um, it was the People's Trust for Endangered Species over in the UK who, um, who published this. So yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. I use it the whole time as well. Um, so there's a few questions in the chat that I'll start with. Deirdre asks, where do we find plant pathologists that can help us identify things that we might find in our gardens or area of work? Uh, good question. Uh, in the Department of Agriculture, uh, there are the back Western would be the diagnostic center. Uh, sometimes material gets sent on then to uh, Northern Ireland, to AFB, um, there are some of us who can identify things uh, either using classical taxonomy and microscopy and genetics. So uh, I can give you a list. I know uh, the department would like um, when they have capacity to send material to them. And um, there are a range of uh, people very good at flies or uh, different aspects, beetle experts, and then I do mycology, that there's a range of people there. So I can uh, make a list and um, maybe as a resource, uh, pass on some good websites and information and email addresses. Yeah, that'd be great, Maria. Thank you. And I'll send that on to everyone along with the um recording as well the link to the youtube recording um so then there is another question um sorry i just need to scroll up um so sonia was wondering how quickly can a hedgerow be destroyed by you know one of these pathogens or bacteria or pests yeah, it's, it's hard to know when they become established. Some are very cryptic and you don't see them until they're causing harm. So they can be sitting around for a long time. But when uh, something very contagious and aggressive 
it's a matter of months to a couple of years. I know Ash Dieback has torn through Europe and has uh, worked with different organisms, though, and you do have the complexity of a stack of, uh, I call it a cascade of different organisms that jump on the bandwagon when if you are sick with a flu you can get other things um shingles whatever if your immune system is compromised and it works the same way in nature and um, for trees and plants so it might not be just one thing that that affects you or takes you out it can and that might be a secondary thing that finishes you off but um yeah it's kind of on the months to years Mm -hmm. um and i suppose we kind of discussed this a bit during the call as well so thank thanks very much maria um in regards to you know diggers and kind you know with contractors and machines cutting the hedgerows is that um is that an issue do you think or is it okay if say contractors are generally operating within their local area uh i love a minimum approach to to harm and damage I, I think a lot of things are done in the name of health and safety and traffic uh, visibility but uh it can be more honed and i think if people in the past people used to go out and do some of that work with sides and bill hooks themselves and kind of minimize but a lot of the the visibility issues can be quite low down and due to umbilifers and other uh say uh, depending on where you live in the country it could be meadow sweet doing really well and sticking out onto a hedgerow uh, from a hedgerow into a road and people get the impression if they're driving past that brambles scratching the sides it's more about paintwork sometimes than it is about safety and that's that's an issue really in how we are in everything yeah i suppose the question was actually kind of in regards to the sterilization of them like constraining oh, yes. the yes of course i'm sorry it's not often part of i know someone recently doing a chainsaw training course and cleaning the chainsaw was didn't come up at all and so uh, and I've seen heavy plant machinery that uh, has algae growing on it. It obviously hasn't been washed in months and months, if not a year. So, uh, no, I think uh, that hygiene, we've seen places where ash dieback has been spread along a hedgerow uh, along cut material. So we know and from there are international studies, not just anecdotal work to show how um, machinery can spread disease and um that that is not trivial it's really really important that uh handling the material and what's done with the material afterwards as well so shredding of material and spreading it back across the ditch um maybe smothering all of the forbs and soft material in the front of the hedgerow that's happened in front of my house today like you know this care and attention and then if damaged material is incorporated in is it spread there is material gathered and turned into mulch and spread somewhere else um all of this is just spreading disease and pests wider um thanks very much um there's a few more questions in the chat i'm just going to focus on the pathogen related ones folks just um as that's Maria's area of expertise. But if you're reading any of the chats, the comments in the chat and think you know you, you might know the answer, um, th then please feel free to reply to those directly. Um, so there was a question in regards to the European plant plague. You know what you mentioned, there's over 600 host species of that. So what is the likelihood of that maybe passing to Ireland and what's being done to prevent that? Is there specific checks being done at the ports, for example? Yeah. Great question. There's a, a kind of very scary inevitability about things moving around Europe. Trade is put first and plant health is down the line of uh, things that are seen as important. At least that's how it works. Uh, something gets a hold in a country and then it's a matter of what do we do to manage it thereafter everywhere. Um, and they're, they're, the borderless thing does not work for us and we can't enforce an island status very easily without emergency legislation. So there's pushback against that. So I think um, 
there's a, a big issue there uh, with xylella fastidiosa. It's invisible and uh, it may be here. You know, the numbers of people who are out looking for it uh, are few and the people who can see the damage and report it um, and get something done. And what do we do? Really, it's just uh, destruction of the material is our only way so far to deal with that. And we're losing the battle. So there is that horrible feeling that when something takes hold in Europe, it moves around Europe fairly quickly. Yeah, it's just kind of people spotting it and, you know, but it's difficult to spot, as you're saying as well, if it's, you know, until until it's too late almost. Well, it, um, it, Katie, on yeah. that, it attacks gorse, for example, and we have seen gorse die back in Ireland and there's a kind of mystery as to what's causing it. Um, and it could be Zoylella fastidious. I'm not trying to get people very worried or concerned, but Ireland is becoming a hub for two giant trading areas. If Brexit goes through uh, what the plans are for Brexit, which is to open it up to um, the rest of the world, basically, for trade. So that would be as a European hub. And then we're uh, um, on the edge of a... Uh, British um, global trade hub as well um, and we yeah. could be getting the worst of both worlds that way yeah yeah it's kind of too prompt <laughs> we, we have we have trouble coming from both ends um, and the, so I'm mindful that it's five past eight now so we will wrap up soon but um, there's a couple of more questions that I thought would be uh, good to ask you so there was someone who was wondering as well about you know, pathogens jumping species. So maybe you can touch on that and how maybe that's linked to biodiversity loss as well. I know globally that would be one of the factors that's contributing to kind of um, zoonotic diseases as well. So maybe you can just touch on that in a plant health context. So for example, with fire blight or, you know, with with other diseases as well. Yeah, so fire blight can uh, affect a lot of uh, fruit uh, trees and so it has that economic uh, impact that makes it to the fore a little bit more but a lot of pathogens uh, are species specific uh, for the fungi there was this circularity in the tradition of describing species so that things were named for the species they were found with uh, the host that they were on. So you get a lot of Alni or um, Betularis, uh, this kind of thing. And I think genetics is helping to broaden that out. But there are a lot of pathogens that have a huge range of, pa of potential hosts. And uh, so some are restricted by one single species host, one um, family group or a set within that family, like the stone fruit and not the others. Um, and then some things will uh, affect hundreds of things, uh, the way Xylella seems to. So it's very hard to say. You can also have things that didn't traditionally affect the host as a pathogen, and they switch from being a saprophyte or sitting there kind of doing a little bit of damage but nothing much into a full-blown pathogen so um, and that's very much driven by climate change or an ev evolution in our understanding of these things because it's not that long ago since they were described to science and then we have genetics to throw at this as well so uh, yeah we're it's kind of conflating a lot of things in that Katie and uh, not a simple question to answer yeah Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, there's so many different factors um, affecting it. There was another question in or kind of a, a comment as well in regards to the importance of protecting our native species as pest control, as a natural pest control. Um, so maybe you can comment on that as well in regards to some of the diseases and the fungal fungi that you mentioned earlier. Natural pest control. So. Uh... I'm not sure what we mean by that. So in regards to by um by kind of not protecting our native insects by the with the decline in pollinators and birds or you know hedgerow destruction that we're then affecting the sort of creatures that would naturally suppress the more negative ones. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I was as I was driving in, I was thinking of another point there. Um, some wise person uh has put in um street lighting out into the uh, a long way out from the local town here, and it's running along uh what was a PNHA. Um, the problem with lighting even is that you will have insects drawn to the light. And bats and other uh, larger um, uh, things like moths, the microleptoptera, so uh, they also are pollinators and they are uh, very much compromised by lighting along hedgerows at night, so especially um, white light rather than the reddish uh, sodium and argon lights of the past uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well but from the point of view of treatments um i'm just thinking and i may be going off point here uh lots of people have sworn by garlic solutions and things in the past to treat things uh, variations of bordeaux mixtures as, as sprays but uh, even with bordeaux mixture things are being banned um so it's really quite tricky and prevention is still seen as the best form of of managing things for insects it's even harder because um they may be vectors and they may be targeted as such and then you have non-species targeted biocontrols um, inflicted on them and so it, it goes round and round and round and there is no easy way to manage these things and it's really quite hard for the people controlling the diseases and pests too because they're cutting felling healthy looking trees and this is going to get worse with xylella because the uh, one tactic has been to create a buffer zone so to take out healthy material and to burn it to to stop it from spreading wider so you've got all of those issues with management once something gets in yeah, it's pre pre as you were saying, prevention is key. Um, so the last three questions slash comments that I'll give you, and then we'll wrap up because I'm mindful that it's uh, getting late. Um, so Pat was wondering, you know, one can once the pathogens are in Ireland locally, you know, will can they spread through wildlife as well? Through, for example, will birds spread particular pathogens, or you, you know? Yeah, um, pretty much anything that moves. I mean, we're a huge uh, pathogen mover. Uh, you see truckloads of ash cut ash being transported around the place. I followed, uh, was just stuck behind a truck there a month ago that was bringing a truckload of leaves and that were blowing out from the top of the truck as it went along. So every time we move material, and, and you know, that's not to say we're moving... Uh, thousands of tons of topsoil and uh, as well so it's it's really quite difficult and I think that's where the compromises kick in it's kind of like sure we're all moving around anyway and we're all moving all this material around anyway what's a bit more of it and that becomes the hard bit to cut back on is that no we shouldn't be doing much of any of this and to blame birds and to blame insects for doing it when we're really the cause i mean in the last 50 years we've been moving more plant material around the world than has been done in millions of years before us so and we're moving freight very quickly by plane not in huge volumes but uh, containers can be shipped from one side of the world to the other with intact geckos at the other side. And the problem, the poor little things are put down because, well, if they don't die of the cold, if they arrive here, um, they are uh, put down because um, there's no real easy way to deal with them. So things on that scale we can see, but anything smaller and tiny um yeah i i don't think we should be blaming insects or birds for what's basically our creation as a problem mm. um and i'm going to come back to that 
one the the th thing of moving trees because I kind of want to finish up on that in regards to nurseries but um in between that there is a question that was actually I see it's it's already sort of been answered but maybe you have um some more insights into it as well is um particular pathogens on the species holly alder larch and some mountain ash if you've seen you know anything in particular in regards to those tree species yeah, there's some concerns, and I know there were a lot of concerns about holly in the past, but uh, personally, I see holly managing okay, and maybe it's particular areas, and I'd love to know more about people's concerns there. Um, alder is suffering from quite a few uh, fungal pathogens, um, and, and just the load of material that attacks alder. Um, it's also suffering from things like uh, flooding. So where alder can cope with a certain amount of inundation with water around the root system and lives in water some of the year round, if that drastically changes and there's a lot more uh, flooding or the quality of that water is poor, then you have mm. additional issues for alder and that weakening um, and lots of things to capitalize on it, like uh, some of the Inonotus, um bracket fungus in particular. Um, but Tephrina alni, yeah, makes the seed then unviable. And so it's getting it from both sides. Larch has been a major sufferer of sudden oak death um, and I think almost all Japanese larch or anything that's known about has been cut out um, and the other larches are something too. Uh, rowan is particularly poor in its aspect um, in the wild and anything from uh, the virus that I mentioned to uh, oyster mushrooms uh, do quite well on rowan as well. So again, it's the ganging up as well as an initial uh, attacker yeah is is the sudden oak that's the phytophthora is that phytophthora is it or remorum, um, remorum yeah that's the main one yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks or earth last also mentioned um another phytophthora that's on the um on the where is it now on the alder uh, phytophthora alni. alni yes yeah. um there's um cinnamomy as well there's there's a whole bunch of phytophthoras mm. and they're doing really well they're they're the blight or wilt diseases of leaves and uh, so it just looks like the leaf curls up and dies and that's what it does which some of the year you're expecting that to happen so it can be hard to spot um yeah, it's really not waiting till these things get too far before drawing attention to them. If you think there's something new happening, it's a possibility. And if you live near a port or you live uh, yeah, in an estuary, the likelihood is higher. So uh, even when you look at Sylvia Reynolds and alien plants and places, locations in the country where uh, you've gotten a lot of material washing in from um, usually uh, ports with material brought in uh, that then you know these places are likely low side for pathogens to get started as well yeah thanks very much um and the the last th point i want to wrap up on and it's something that um was mentioned in the chat as well is the role of nurseries and maybe you know how can we support and develop more nurseries here in Ireland to increase the supply of Irish provenance trees to reduce this movement so that movement of plants you know from for, to between countries so that may just be the uh, your final comment <laughs> yeah. if, and if I could go on all night just about that I suppose um having uh, I see Ursula's question about super nurseries and this is the problem uh, small local nurseries are not even having to go out to buy material. I know that sounds very idealistic, but uh, we did get rid of plastic bags. We, you know, or you buy them. Okay, we didn't get rid of them, but the idea that we uh, become much more self sufficient uh, in our local material and valuing that material for what it is the miracles that each of these life forms are rather than you know buying bundles of hundreds thousands truckloads whatever um that uh convenience of material uh through 
very large nurseries. I know, in my opinion, and, and it's just my opinion, I think I'd have a serious problem with garden centres in general. But the more I go along, the more I realise that planting out of material and the demand there um, and the clear breakdown in the plant passport and real care um, I know people mean well and the systems are there but they're not working across Europe otherwise we wouldn't be having a talk like this and the major issue is that we need to be looking very locally at this material and not going beyond that because if why do we have super nurseries in the first place? Um, I think that's the problem. And it's not to target anybody who makes their living on this. I'm very conscious that a lot of people do and um, you don't want to hurt anybody. But small local producers with very careful methods um, and they can do that at a small scale and look at everything and check it. Um, whereas relying on checks from uh, government officials to come and you know it's it's not their fault that they fail there's so few of them and they don't um get everywhere and it's easy to um print plant passports there's a whole bunch of things that can go wrong there but if we're generating our own material it's very satisfying it's the best and the safest way possible Brilliant. Thank you so much, Maria. And to, to, there's lots of people saying thank you in the in the comments. Um, you, you remind people of Mary Reynolds, apparently your energy and your knowledge. And, you know, um, yeah, re, it's been a really great talk. So thank you so much for a really wonderful presentation. Um, and we'll put up this link to the recording and also resources that Maria mentioned so the list of pathologists um, or kind of people you can contact if um, you're concerned about something you find on your own land so we'll provide that list of resources for you um, in due course in the next few next few days probably early next week so uh, keep an eye out in your emails um, and yeah thank you again so much for joining thank you very much and in that, we, yeah um, uh, I just realized in, in doing this how little anybody knows uh, at the back of us, you know, uh, there's a lot we can all learn together. And if we work together, we can get somewhere. I think this requires as many people as possible who care about hedgerows and trees and plants and their health in general. And that of the lichens and fungi and uh, insects and butterflies and moths and everything that interact with those because you're not just dealing with an entity and i think that may be where we're going wrong it's that huge community and all of these things that um good things that hedgerows bring to a landscape that we can emphasize um but we won't do it uh except by pulling a lot of people together because it's all about education but then there's that emotional aspect too where people really care and it becomes real to them that there's a lot at stake here not just individual hedgerows unfortunately thank absolutely. you absolutely yeah thank you maria um yeah come together talk to your friends and family that's one of the best things you can do folks <laughs> if you can do nothing else Make sure to use your mouth and, and share the word. Enjoy okay. some elderflower champagne and go black carrying and make it. Yeah, I think we we look after and we uh, protect what we care about. And if we interact and that's the nice thing about learning how to use a scythe and, and walking along um, and doing things carefully and slowly, you really see things and appreciate the beauty in them as well. So thank you very much indeed. And thanks to everybody for listening to me wearing myself out uh, talking to them. Thank you. All right, I'll stop the recording now, folks. Thank you.